The Sacramento Observer has been a pillar of our community for 60 years. Publisher Larry Lee joins us today to talk about this institution's storied history and its future in the digital era. Larry, what does this milestone mean to you? Well, Scott, thanks for having me on. Uh, this is a real special opportunity, I think, for us to really um, step back and uh, celebrate and recognize the accomplishments that we've had as a news organization that has been around for 60 years. Um, also, really, to kind of um, not just reflect on that history, but to build on it. Um, you know, we have been uh, really a leader in the Black press, and, you know, I'm really trying to continue to build on that uh, legacy that we've had. So it's a really exciting period of time. Uh, we'll celebrate in grand fashion uh, throughout the year, but uh, we're really excited about, um, you know, really just taking this moment to pause, reflect on what we've gone through, uh, and really build on what we've, what we've done in the past and, and looking forward to the future. What is the relevance of a newspaper like The Observer mm -hmm. in an era dominated by social media? And now we've even got AI uh, curated intelligence that, that's bringing our news to us. Well, I think the first thing that I would say, and I'll simplify it with one word, uh, which is trust. I think the, um, you know, when you look at uh, news in general, uh, there's constant uh, concerns about how people are consuming news and information and that people just don't trust news uh, in, in a lot of the ways in which they're consuming. The thing that differentiates an organization like The Observer is that we have been doing the work here in Sacramento since 1962. We're a trusted source. People, if, if you've been in Sacramento for any period of time, you knew my parents, you knew me, uh, you've known the work that uh, we've been doing in this community, and, and it's always been for the betterment for uplifting the African-American voice and the African-American experience and the conditions of African-Americans. So people know that they can trust what we're saying, what we're, what we're reporting on, know that we're um, challenging those that need to be challenged, knowing that we're uplifting those that often go uh, unheard and, and unspoken. So, um, you know, the, the tools of social media, uh, AI, video, all these things, they're really just tools that are out there. And, and really, um, you know, it really comes back to the messenger. And that's what the observer is. It's a credible, trusted messenger that has been doing uh, work with excellence proudly and unapologetically for the African-American community for 60 years. You know, you mentioned your parents just a moment ago. Sure. Take us back to the beginning. How did the observer come into being in the first place? Okay, so the observer is older than I am, so I can't. I can't be. I, I wasn't there at the beginning, but I'll tell you. Really, I'm sure you've heard a story. Yes, I've heard a story or two. So yeah, the observer. Um, you know, in in if you imagine Sacramento in 1962, there were about a um, about 15,000 uh, African Americans roughly in the area. Um, my dad, who went to Grant High School, my mom uh, went to McClatchy. Uh, and so they were they were residents here in Sacramento and they were active in the African-American community, civically um, and, and somewhat politically. And, and my dad definitely in the business space as being a real estate um, sales uh, salesperson. And so, um, but the voice of the African-American community was often going unheard. Uh, you wouldn't see anything about our lives, uh, you know, unless it was negative. And at that time, you had the Sacramento Union and the Sacramento Bee. Um, and, and on television, there was no, uh, no real mention of our experience. So there was a, an, a publication that preceded The Observer called the Sacramento Outlook. Uh, it did not publish with regularity. It was mostly run by a, a religious leader, Reverend J.T. Muse. Uh, and my dad and, and six others purchased The Outlook. Uh, they did one publication together and realized that uh, they got themselves into something that they didn't really know what they were getting into. So my father, uh, Gino Gladden and John Cole, two local business uh, business people here in the community, uh, decided to start the Sacramento Observer in, in Thanksgiving week of 1962. 
Um, I often tease my dad, uh, you know, they did not know that, you know, 50, 60 years later, uh, particularly in my dad's case, he'd still be running a, a newspaper. Um, but it, that's where it started. Gino Gladden, uh, unfortunately, passed away very unexpectedly and early. John Cole was a serial uh, entrepreneur. And so if you knew John Cole, you knew he'd be doing a business uh, in one year and two years later, he'd start another business. So uh, the staying in the newspaper business was not uh, in his calling. And it really fell on the responsibilities of my dad, um, William Lee, and my mom, Catherine Lee, uh, as being kind of the caretakers and the, and the runners of that uh, publication. Um, very early, it was really challenging. They didn't really know a lot about uh, not just uh, journalism, but the business side of, of keeping a, a publication in business. So fortunately, my dad, who was very successful in real estate, uh, was able to kind of keep the the doors of the newspaper open with the resources from the uh, from the uh, real estate um, industry. But uh, he really quickly dove into um, the art of the black press. And the black press is nearly 200 years old. old. There's uh, about 200 black newspapers across the country. And he started to learn from many of his predecessors, people who ran, uh, you know, historic publications like the Chicago Defender, uh, the St. Louis American, the, you know, uh, the Michigan Chronicle, lots of uh, New York Amsterdam News, lots of those historic black newspapers. Um, and he learned very quickly. And within 10 years of starting the paper, uh, the Observer was named the nation's best black newspaper, uh, which wow. we went to be named the best black newspaper six times. Wow. You know, uh, I'm, I'm curious about, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm curious about something though. Sacramento uh, as a region is a much larger uh, media market for the Hispanic and AAPI communities. And you mentioned that at the time that The Observer was started, there were about 15,000 African-Americans in Sacramento. To this day, African Americans are a smaller part of the population of our region than, than they are nationally. And yet we have a black newspaper here that has continued for 60 years, and those other populations have not. Sure. What do you think explains the, the ability to survive and thrive for the observer all these years in Sacramento when really the population is fairly small. Yeah, I mean, Sacramento is not what you would call a, what we would call a chocolate city where there's a, a lot of African-Americans here. Although Sacramento does have, uh, you know, a unique distinction in the state of California, it's really been the only uh, community over the last 40 years that has had consistent African-American growth. Over the last 40 years, you know, our, our population has grown by 250% um, to about 160,000 African-Americans. But I think the the thing that you're asking about, the the uh, kind of that magic um, potion, a special cocktail that that allows us to thrive. You know, I'll be I'll be honest and I'll, I'll try and say this as humbly as possible. Um, my dad was a legend. Uh, he was exceptional. He was the dean of the black press in the West. Um, he really. Um, really uh, not just learned, but was able to share and evolve in ways that a lot of publishers, uh, black, white, or otherwise, just are not able to do. Um, and I think that that is part of why I'm here, uh, to be honest, was because I, I think he recognized in me very early um, about my uh, desires and intentions to be involved with, um, you know, with The Observer and the work that we did. As a young person, I, I loved um, really seeing and being involved with the paper. Uh, so, you know, I, I um, came back in 1997, and the fact that I've been here as long as I have, to be honest, sometimes uh, uh, blows me away. But I think as an organization, we've always tried to be very uh, innovative. We've always challenged ourselves. Uh, I remember my dad saying things like, you know, if... Um, we could do it the easy way, but we're not going to because somebody else could do it the easy way. We're going to do it the hard way. Um, and so we would, you know, always do things that were just, you know, just a little bit outside of the box and really challenging uh, our newsroom and challenging our, our, our learnings about, you know, reaching our audience, growing our audience and doing it from a way. And I think this is the other part of it too, doing it from a, a sense of service. I think we've always recognized that the observer, while it is a business um, and while there are uh, other institutions that really 
deal and address with the emotional uh, needs of our communities. We recognize that the observer does have a unique a sense of serving our community. Um, and, and so we always try to lean in and listen to our community and really try and do our work based off of their needs. Well, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about that in the context, Larry, of your survival. Because the the observer is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, and and you're continuing to move forward and evolve and change, and at the same time, the newspaper industry nationally has uh, really gone through maybe its darkest hour sure. in history, and is still going through that with major publications folding, going. Uh, insolvent, um, you know, essentially uh, ceasing publishing, except sure. on a very sort of scattered, um, you know, time frame, And yet it, uh, the observer is continuing on. What lessons, and, and I really want to get specific on this, what lessons or muscles uh, did you all learn or muscles did you all develop because you've had to be scrappier Sure. That prepared you in maybe a way that our dominant mainstream sure. newspapers weren't. Uh, that's really insightful, Scott. I mean, I think that is really uh, the core of where we are today for, for the organization. Um, you know, again, I mentioned I came back in, in 1997. Uh, it's, you know, Running a Black-owned anything is challenging. <laughs> um, uh, any sort of business uh, organization, nonprofit, service service uh, organization, church, they're, they're just challenging because people often undervalue our community, undervalue our voice, uh, undervalue our needs. Um, and so, so that that is a challenge, first of all. Right. So uh, so you're right. There are certain muscles um, uh, that you develop, certain amount of metal that you create um, and armor that you put on uh, that uh, allows you to do the work of serving the African-American community, no matter what industry you're in. Then you throw in the newspaper and media industry. Um, when I came back in 1997, uh, I came back, I went to San Jose State. I was in the midst of, of you know, all of the Silicon Valley growth and, and the technological explosions that were going on in the South Bay. And so I was very aware and, and in tune with, you know, technology and how it can serve and uh, and how we can use it to, to build audience. And so we came, I came back with a, a great energy in, in really doing a lot of that work. But then you had the early 2000s where newspapers uh, were really and and were really challenged and it didn't matter what kind of newspaper you were in they were all being um, we were all being challenged with uh, you know social media and technology and and websites and and so we went through uh, at that point in my perspective uh, was really the darkest times the early 2000s because um, you know the the uh, advertising budgets and the historical model of advertising through newspapers was getting blown up and destroyed. Um, and so during it was during that time when I really, uh, really had to lean in and get my hands dirty on trying to not just um, <laughs> really almost just trying to get from week to week. Um, and I think what um, you know, then as I as I progressed as uh, through the organization as, and as a leader, um, you know, I, I was really focused on uh, the the transition of my parents uh, as they passed on and beginning to develop this this sheet of you know things that I wanted to do as a, as a vision for our organization um, and a lot of it was um, making sure that we honored and recognized the legacy and the foundation that we have which is a print product but then kind of retooling it and re-evaluating re it. Uh, so we've done some amazing things over the last few years with um, refining the, the amount of resources that we spend on that print product and kind of doing this dual transformation of, you know, the newspaper and the digital um, sort of uh, content. And it's been really, uh, we've been very blessed. I think in, in this moment of uh, post-COVID and which, which is the kind of the other time marker that, that I'll say, and, and, and I, I'll use 2020 as kind of being the signature year. You had obviously 
COVID, you had the killing of George Floyd, you had, um, you know, this, this, uh, and not just George Floyd, but the, many of uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and all of those. So you had this social uh, unrest. Um, and then you also had, you know, a very polarized political climate. And I think that what people recognized during that period was it was less about, um, you know, these tools that might get to people in the masses, but coming back to your original question about trust, finding those trusted organizations that have been in the community and doing the work. And we were in this special moment, we were also developing more technology. And, you know, it's just been, it's been amazing. So during COVID, more than 300 newspapers went out of business, 16, more than 6,000 journalists have lost their jobs. Our story is we've tripled the size of our newsroom, tripled revenue, um, and are on a on a path of sustainability and growth that is almost unprecedented in the Black press. I, I, I got to ask you about that because you have spoken before in the past about how difficult it is within this region to get advertising dollars that really do have a place uh, sure. with the observer. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to go back to one of your examples before, um, which is on healthcare. Mm -hmm. During open enrollment, uh, African Americans may be a lower percentage of the Sacramento population than they are nationally, but they are a quantum uh, larger percentage of the population of state employees. Right. Yet when open enrollment happens and the big health plans and hospital systems are all vying for patients, typically when the observer has gone to try and capture some of those advertising dollars, because those are high paying, full premium patients, those health systems and healthcare plans direct you over to the charitable parts sure. of their organization rather than sales and marketing. It's like they don't take you seriously. Speak to me about how it is that, um, that takes place and what it is that whether that sort of backward thinking is still in existence within your uh, business climate. Sure. So I think big picture, um, the, 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 the real challenge with a lot of, you know, advertising and, and how it's, uh, how it's uh, executed in our space uh, really relies on uh, advertising agencies um, that oftentimes are representing their clients. Um, and so the challenge is educating advertising agencies about the importance of um, using uh, alternative forms of media and, and, and things that are not uh, easy to do. And I say easy to do. It's easy for an advertising agency or a client to place uh, what they call programmatic advertising, those ads that you see on your phone because you went to this website and then it, then you go to another website and it pops up on your phone because they they followed you know how you were how you were visiting. Um, so it's easy for agencies to do that. Uh, the The challenge is getting those agencies to understand and recognize that a um, client that they may have uh, might have a very specific brand purpose. Uh, that they want to reach a specific audience. And, and I'll, I'll use again this kind of this, this post um, George Floyd era where there was a lot of um, corporations that spoke very clearly about we want to make sure that we are investing more in the African-American community. We're going to uh, increase our, our advertising But spending. did they do it? Well, that's where I'm headed, right? Well, no. Well, well, let's get there. Did they do it? So, so no, they haven't done it. Now, some in instances, some corporations have, and they, and it's been incremental. They may have gone from two percent advertising with minority media to three percent. Um, it is, it is, it is a uh, something that is very difficult for them to do if they are not committed to it. The reality is they have to be committed to it as an organization and then tell the agency. That but I want to get uh, but I want to get back to the original thing that you've discussed before in the past. Mm -hmm. If if a 
bonafide advertiser that's advertising in a mainstream publication and spends marketing and advertising dollars over there to reach a target market and you reach their target market and they look at spending with you as a philanthropic contribution that comes out of their charity it's, it's budget, not the same thing. they're not taking you seriously. That's no, what not. you said before. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so is that still the same post George Floyd as it was before? It absolutely still the same. Absolutely. Because so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> well, so the, so the reality is, is again, back to the educating the agencies and, and to be honest, really the, the Scott and, and, you know, in the best way I can say this advertising agencies in general uh, do not look like America. Uh, they do not represent the, the diversity that America is. Um, and so what often happens is they spend with who looks like them, right? And so that's where the challenge is. Um, and so uh, until we can uh, really get ad, hold ad agencies accountable, um, and some, you know, there's some, um, you know, people in my industry, uh, people like Byron Allen, who've been calling out ad agencies and corporations. Byron Allen sues a different uh, company every, every right. six months. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you this, Larry. Mm -hmm. To go back to the population thing, if the percentage of the African-American population in Sacramento was similar to Washington, D.C. or Chicago, mm -hmm. could those same advertising agencies get away with that behavior? Um, they do, unfortunately, and in, in with my peers in D.C., Detroit, Chicago, they undervalue, it comes back to this original conversation that I said, I, this point that I brought up about them undervaluing our voice, undervaluing our purpose. And uh, that's what, when, when we talk about the, the, you know, 2020, there was, there was, uh, you know, some shoulder shaking where people just had to listen to us. Um, that has to continue. We have to have, uh, um, you know, consistent pressure, uh, persistent um, you know, agitation uh, with with these uh, corporations and and the like to make them make sure that they listen to us. Let, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the future. Uh, a partnership and collaboration seem to be a very strong part of your operating style. Yeah. What relationships um, have you developed that are important to? The, the the future that you've described earlier for the observer within sure. our region and beyond? Well, I, I live my life, I feel like, by there's an African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and, uh, you know, it's in that spirit that uh, I've always really tried to, and I, I learned this from my parents, but I always tried to... Um, to move our, our, our work forward. So uh, over the last um, uh, couple of years, I've been able to partner with uh, nine other black newspapers across the country. We launched a brand called Word in Black. And basically what we do is we're, uh, we've been able to develop uh, a, a really a media brand that is amplifying the work of these 10 black newspapers in these 10 communities throughout the country. Uh, and it's in cities, you know, throughout in every major uh, city throughout the uh, throughout the country. Uh, over the year, over the last two years, uh, we've been able to raise millions of dollars. Uh, in both advertising, branded content partnerships, um, and 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 philanthropy uh, to help us um, really build a newsroom. We have nine staff reporters with Word in Black. Not to mention um, the the other organizations themselves have been also providing content. We've got more than fifty thousand unique uh, subscribers to a newsletter. So that's one area that we've. Uh, been a part of at the national level. And then locally, uh, we also were able to bring together um, a collaboration, which is very challenging in your local market, uh, called uh, Solving Sacramento, um, that has allowed us to uh, work with organizations like uh, Cap Capital Public Radio, the Business Journal, News Review, Outward Magazine, and others to really help um, amplify uh, specific needs in our community, and right now we're we're really focused on affordable housing stories, um, and so we're we're I think collaboration is really important. Um, you know, you learn a lot when you're working with those that you don't normally get to work with, um, and so I think that that uh, provides a really great opportunity for us to to have industry learnings and to build, uh, you know, what we feel is um, and and serve our community in ways that we weren't able to do before.
And I think that we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, uh, much success to you and the Observer, and congratulations on 60 years. Thank you, Scott, for having me. All right. And that's our show. Thanks to our guest, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.